Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As the two previous presentations clearly showed, immunotherapy rocks. And uh, it's exciting, and even hardcore molecular uh, oncogenesis colleagues of mine are suddenly turning to immunolo immunology, which is really shocking. And sometimes, even for us immunologists, it's hard to believe how important the immune system turns out to be for cancer. And this is one of the examples. It's work by Jérôme Gallon and colleagues. And here we, we see um, survival of uh, early stage uh, colon carcinoma patients, stage one, two, and three, by uh, invasion, uh, localization of the tumor. And when we actually stratify these patients by the infiltration of memory T cells, something quite startling appears. Uh, these are patients with low, uh, with high, sorry, high infiltration of memory T cells in their tumors. And these are patients that have low infiltrations. And all of a sudden it becomes very clear that even at early stages of tumor development, uh, the immune system may modulate the eventual outcome of the for these patients. So there's now a big uh, international consortium that is studying whether um, this will uh, be a meaningful addition to the usual prognosis for uh, colon cancer patients. Now, one of the questions we in the lab are asking is can we also use the immune status of patients prior to therapy uh, as a way of personalized medicine to see if there are certain patients that may benefit more from immunotherapy than others? And can we find these uh, parameters in uh, more systemic analyses? Um, my talk today will be on prostate cancer. Um, prostate cancer is still a very important um, cause of death among elderly men. One in six men are, are affected, I should say. Um, it's an infl uh, inflammation-related oncogenesis, and the, the disease is amenable to immune control. So there are several um, experimental um, therapies that are clinically tested at the moment. And I think, generally speaking, we can divide them into two um, sorts of immunotherapies. There are more the vaccine-related therapy strategies and the checkpoint inhibitors of, uh, about which we heard so much in uh, the previous talks. Now, um, prostate cancer can be a long, a drawn-out disease where, uh, in first instance, it responds to endocrine therapy, uh, blocking androgens. And then at some point, um, the disease becomes, the tumors become insensitive to this, and then we reach a state also known as hormone refractory or uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And we see rising PSA levels, but no symptoms yet. And this is actually the state in which many of the experimental immunotherapies have been tested in these men prior to full-blown metastatic disease. Um, this is a table showing an overview. I'll show some of the uh, examples later. Cipulucil T, which is actually the first FDA-approved vaccine, a cell-based vaccine for cancer. Uh, Ipilimumab, which we already heard about. Prostvac, which is a vaccinia virus-based vaccine. Uh, DNA vaccines encoding the tumor antigen PAP. And then there is uh, also there are other monoclonal uh, antibody-based therapies. And many of these have been tested in randomized phase two or even phase three studies. Now, Cipulucil T, or Provenge, is probably the best known. It consists of um, treating the PBMCs, the peripheral blood uh, mononuclear cell fractions of patients, with a fusion protein consisting of GMCSF, the stimulatory immune stimulatory molecule, fused to the tumor antigen PEP. And as a result, uh, antigen presenting cells, <laughs> slides turn out very funky uh, with this computer, um, the, uh, the antigen presenting cells are stimulated by this cocktail and they also take up the tumor antigen and are then able to um, activate effector cytotoxic T cells that can attack the tumor cells and kill them. Now, in um, a number, a few, a phase three large scale randomized trials, uh, in patients, there was found a survival benefit of this particular therapy with a median survival benefit of about four months. And this led to the FDA approval for this, um, this particular therapy. Another one that's currently being tested in combination with chemotherapy in phase three trials is Prostvac, which consists of a pox... Ooh, I'm giving it away already. Which is a pox virus uh, which encodes for the tumor antigen PSA in combination with a number of... Um, 
co-stimulatory molecules. And the viruses can either infect keratinocytes or directly infect dendritic cells. And through direct priming of T cells or indirectly, these T cells again become activated and can kill tumors. And in phase two randomized trials, it was a clear survival benefit. So this uh, vaccine is now also being tested in combination with chemotherapy in uh, prostate cancer patients. Um, we've already heard about the importance of checkpoint inhibitors. And um, um, here we see that by blocking CTLA4, there is an unbridled proliferation activation of T cells that can actually aid in anti immune tumor responses, uh, sorry, anti tumor immune responses, obviously. Now, uh, at the ESMO just now, and Fons provided me, kindly provided me with this slide since he was part of this trial, um, there was a presentation on uh, a phase three randomized trial in which patients received a single dose bone directed radiotherapy uh, regimen followed either by uh, epilimumab or a placebo. And um, they looked, in first instance, the primary endpoint was survival. And actually, this primary endpoint was not met, but they did see an improvement in progression-free survival and improved PSA responses. And when a sub-analysis was done on patients with clinically more favorable uh, um, characteristics, a survival benefit was shown. Now, one of the things that this therapy shows is that maybe, <laughs> no maybe about it, that it's important to characterize the patients that will mostly benefit from these therapies. There are a number of these experimental therapies um, that are arising for prostate cancer, so it's a good time for prostate cancer patients in that respect. And um, the interesting and ch nice challenge now is to combine these in the right way to achieve optimal results. For instance, there's also a new generation of androgen uh, inhibitors like abiraterone, and uh, researchers are now looking into possibilities of combining these also with, for instance, checkpoint inhibition or possible uh, vaccine strategies. We ourselves have performed um, a phase one, two clinical study combining a GMCSF secreting vaccine together with anti-CTLA-4 blockade. Uh, the vaccine GVAX consisted of two cell lines, LNCAP and PC3, that were transduced to express GMCSF. And the GMCSF served to attract dendritic cells and activate them so that they would take up the tumor antigens derived from the vaccine and activate CTLs. At the same time, by providing anti-CTLA-4, the T cell response was further boosted in an effort to direct immunity against the cancer. So it's a two-pronged approach, combining this prostate GVAX with ipilimumab or Eurofoy. Um, the GVAX was given every two weeks for a total of 13 uh, vaccine administrations, while the ipilimumab was given monthly. And uh, in first instance, uh, dose escalation was performed from 0.3 to 5 mg per kg for the uh, anti-CTLA-4. And we saw different types of responses. In five patients, we saw quite a dramatic PSA decline, which was quite durable, as it turned out. A number of patients remained stable, while in uh, another um, number of patients, there was progressive disease. And this is an overview. So in total, 28 patients were included in this trial, and five of them we found partial responses based on PSA declines, while 12 showed stable disease. Um, this was published in a Lancet Oncology paper last year with Fons as uh, first author. Um, as I already mentioned, these PSA declines turned out to be quite durable, sometimes up to 31 months, and could some in some cases be confirmed on bone scan, uh, showing regression, uh, regressing metastases. And these um, bone uh, responses could also be quite durable in a number of cases. Uh, also, we saw autoimmune breakthrough events, um, particularly hypophysitis related. So in seven patients, we found hypophysitis as an adverse event. Uh, but in five of five of this, these, this was also accompanied by a partial response. So there is a definite connection in this trial between the autoimmune effects and the clinical uh, responses that we observed. All of them were actually successfully treated with standard hormone replacement therapy. Well, turns, this turns to the main subject of the talk, immune monitoring. We wanted to monitor these patients extensively to see if we could find immune biomarkers that could predict, 
predict uh, clinical responses, but also hopefully um, so that we could select patients in the long run and also avoid unnecessary exposure to any autoimmune effects which is uh, accompanying this particular therapy. And uh, finally, we were also hoping to get further insight in the underlying uh, mechanisms of the therapeutic eff efficacy that we observed. Of course, this is a phase one study, so everything we find is necessarily more hypothesis generating than anything, and all these bio biomarkers will have to be confirmed and validated in follow-up randomized trials. Um, I want to show you some results of um, flow cytometric analyses that we performed on immune effector subsets prior and during therapy, uh, looking at their activation status and frequencies, and hopefully we'll also end up with some functional assays that, that we performed during follow-up in these patients. Um, starting with the absolute lymphocyte count, for ipilimumab in melanoma patients, this was found as a possible predictive marker. And what we found was that the increase in the lymphocyte count that we found in these patients was actually um, related to survival, with patients showing more of a rise in these lymphocyte counts doing better. We also looked at a number of activation markers on T cells, and in general we did observe an activation, so an upregulation of all these markers, but actually the relation to survival was rather disappointing. So uh, in general there was activation, but this did not seem to be really related to ultimate survival in these patients. We also looked at regulatory T cells, which are suppressive and can suppress both effector T cells and antigen presenting cells in their functions. And what we found was uh, quite interesting that the Treg levels went up in some of the patients during treatment, but this was particularly in patients showing either progressive disease or a stable disease based on their PSA levels. So patients with a partial response, we did not find this upregulation of Treg so much. And uh, when we determined the effector T helper ratio versus the Treg ratio upfront, so prior to therapy, we found that patients with a higher ratio performed much better and had a longer survival. So in general, we did find, as you might expect, that Tregs were predictive for um, poor survival. Um, an interesting observation that we made was the expression of CTLA-4 in effector T helper cells, so not Tregs, but actually uh, normal T helper cells, which appeared to be elevated in our prostate cancer patients versus a group of sex and age matched donors. And when we looked for this particular parameter and uh, looked for survival effects, we found a clear indication that patients that had these elevated levels showed a better survival on our therapy regimen. So this might be a predictive marker, particularly as it is an upfront marker, so it might have predictive value. And interestingly, uh, recently a paper appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine where microarray analyses were performed on peripheral blood, looking also for biomarkers in prostate cancer patients, in this case for of prognostic value. And uh, researchers observed that one of the predictive uh, gene signatures had to do, and you probably can't read this, but with reduced CD28 signaling in T cells. And this might well be consistent with our CTLA4 uh, observations on T helper cells, which would indicate that it might be a prognostic marker. We also looked at myeloid subsets, because um, ipilimumab may not be only important in modulating T cells. By um, blocking the interaction between myeloid antigen presenting cells and, for instance, Treg, uh, it might modulate the production of uh, T cell suppressive enzymes like arginase and uh, endolamine deoxygenase. So we also looked at the effects on myeloid subsets. And one of the most important things we found was that during treatment with GFAX and IPI, the activation state of peripheral dendritic cells went up. And here you see uh, two subsets for which this was the case by activation marker CD40. And actually this upregulation, uh, this activation on both these subsets combined was also a clear indication for improved survival. Another subset is myeloid-derived suppressor cells. These are myeloid cells that can actually suppress T cells in their effector function. They're characterized by being, in this case, CD14 positive and HLA-DR negative. And we observed that they went up over treatment, but it was in particular their upfront, so pre-treatment levels that were predictive for survival, with higher levels of these myeloid suppressive cells being predictive for a shorter survival, possibly. 
All right, if we put all these markers together, we found that, uh, and we did a cluster analysis, uh, we basically found two interesting groups, a group of patients with um, high levels of dendritic cell and monocyte activation, uh, and low levels of myeloid-derived suppressor cells up front before therapy. Well, there was also, were also patients that showed this CTLA-4 uh, T-helper phenotype. And when we look at these two groups, actually both of them show an advantage in survival. They have a, a longer survival relative to patients who do not show these markers in uh, upfront analyses. So we believe that these markers may provide uh, a comprehensive biomarker, immune biomarker panel, uh, easily assessed by fax analysis. And we would like to validate these in larger groups of patients that are also treated with ipilimumab alone, for instance, to see if we can use these as predictive markers. Uh, importantly, we also stratified all these uh, markers according to a Halabi score in the patients, which is a sign of prognosis, and we did not find any um, relationship there. So apparently the patient groups were not different, divided by their prognostic factors in general, which underscores the possible predictive nature of these biomarkers. Okay, so validation is next. Then finally, in the last few minutes, I want to show some of the functional uh, results that we observed in these patients. Um, immunologists um, know that immunology can be very difficult and uh, it's never black and white. That's why I like to make it black and white. So when we look at cytokine profiles, generally speaking, immunologists would like to say that T helper one cytokine profiles, stimulating cellular immunity, that's like a good thing, while the rest is basically not so much a good thing. And we looked for these cytokine profiles prior to treatment and during treatment in the patients. And basically what we saw was that during treatment, and particularly T helper two cytokines, Rised, whereas um, the type 1 cytokines sort of stayed level. So this is maybe not entirely what we expected. And actually, when you look for, for instance, a very uh, a really T-helper 2 type cytokine like IL-5, we find that the rising levels of this cytokine were clearly related with a better survival. And also, importantly, when we looked at antibody responses against a panel of tumor antigens, we found that there seemed to be a positive correlation between these IL-5 levels and the ability of the patients to raise uh, multiple antibody responses to tumor antigens. In fact, when we looked at this, there were three tumor antigens that we identified together with our colleagues at Cell Genesis, where reactivity against these three antigens seemed to have a clear um, predictive value for survival in these patients. So, um, whereas we're also trained to think about T cell immunity against tumors, this uh, does um, give us the question, could there be serological control of tumor growth? And as um, our colleagues from Dana-Farber already showed, it is very well possible that there are functional antibodies in these patients, for instance, modulating angiogenesis, as um, Glenn Dranov and colleagues showed. So um, I think this is very interesting and something we might also like to look into in this patient cohort. Now, finally, we also looked at T cell responses against some tumor antigens, for instance, NYE cell 1. And this one caught our attention because Jet Walchok and colleagues showed in melanoma patients that upfront reactivity to this particular antigen also had predictive value for a clinical outcome in ipilimumab treated patients. And indeed, we could uh, find a group, subgroup of patients that had uh, pre treatment responses, pre existent responses against this antigen. And these patients showed a better survival characteristic. But also, quite interestingly, when we look during follow-up at these patients, the responses that are present prior to treatment appear to disappear on treatment, only to return after treatment. And we think that one of the things that might be going on, it's a very hopeful explanation of this observation, is that these cells are being recruited to effector sites like uh, tumors, but also to the vaccination sites um, where we took biopsies and we expanded T cells from these sites. And we found that in particularly against the PC3 component in the vaccine, during treatment there was a selective upregulation of cytotoxic activity against the cell line contained within this vaccine. So we're thinking that maybe these might also consist of NYE cell specific T cells, something worth looking into. So one of the final conclusions is that um, 
there might be a recruitment of prostate cancer reactive T cells to tumor and effector sites. Which leads me to the final concluding slide. So immune monitoring can provide insight in immune mechanisms. Uh, and certainly, we hope it might also provide potentially useful biomarkers for patient selection and a personalized uh, approach to these vaccination and immune checkpoint inhibitor ther therapies. Finally, um, I want to thank the team of mostly girls that performed these experiments. Um, I want to particularly mention Saskia Sandegut and Anita Stam, who did the main part of all the work and were well rewarded for it. And I would also like to mention uh, Fons van en Eertweg and Wienald Gerritsen in particular, who were the principal investigators on the clinical trial. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tanya. Are there any questions? Hi, Els Verdegang from Leiden. I wanted to know whether the CTLA-4 um, uh, positive cells are reactive against the uh, tumor vaccine. Did you ever test it? No. Very good question, of course. We never did test that. Um, because they are actually um, not as high in the frequency as you would like. So we would need more of them to... Uh, I, but uh, as we found them up front, so I guess this is a very important thing to do, is to isolate them from prostate cancer patients and see if we can find reactivity. But unfortunately, unlike melanoma, it's not always immediately clear what antigen to look for. But in this case, it might actually be NYE cell. So that's yeah, a good suggestion. Yeah, certainly. <laughs>